Hello everyone, it is Chelsea Fagan and I am back with another episode of The Financial Confessions with a guest that we are all super excited to have here at our office in New York, someone that you guys have highly requested. But before I say hello to her, I want to say a quick hello to our beloved partners with whom we make every episode of The Financial Confessions. So as you guys probably have heard by now, we make every episode of The Financial Confessions in partnership with Intuit. And if you haven't heard about Intuit yet, you have almost certainly come across some of their awesome products. Basically, Intuit makes all of the different tools that you need to keep in your back pocket and help make every financial decision you're going to make and every financial obstacle you're going to have to get over so much easier and simpler. They make things like TurboTax, which helps navigate the tax filing process and ensure you get the best possible refund. They make Mint, which helps you manage your budget in an extremely intuitive and visual way. I've used it for I think like seven years now, and it's awesome. Uh, they make QuickBooks, which is great for managing your small business expenses. I use it every single day here at TFD. And even if you're someone who freelances or you pick up side gigs, you are a small business of one, and I could not recommend QuickBooks more to help manage all of your various uh, expenses and all of the various finances of running a small business. Uh, Intuit just makes fantastic products and they all work together in a beautiful little harmony to help make your financial life so much smarter. So if you cannot wait to get started with some of their awesome products, check out the link in our description or our show notes. So as I mentioned, our guest today is someone that you guys have highly requested and you guys have tons of really exciting questions for her. Her name is Beth, but you may know her as Budget Bites. Hi. Hello, Budget Bites. (laughs) Thanks for having me. It was so funny. She flew in from Nashville today for this uh, recording and I was back here and when you arrived, like my colleague who's a huge fan came in and she was like, Budget Bites is here. And I'm like, I don't know that we should call her Budget Bites. <laughs> no, that's fine. I know all of my blogger friends by their blog name too. <laughs> um, so tell our audience who may not know about you a little bit about what you do, who you are, Sure. Et cetera. So I run a food blog that um, focuses mainly on cooking, making really delicious, well-balanced meals on a small budget. And I started this blog 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, um, because I was in a really sticky financial situation myself. And I cut out all discretionary spending out of my budget already. And the only part of my budget I had left that had any sort of wiggle room was my food. Um, And I had just graduated with a degree in nutritional science. So I knew I had to make something that was going to be good for me and still fit in a budget. So I started experimenting. I got really excited about it. I started putting it online and I realized a lot of other people out there also needed that information. So it's kind of been my mission for the past 10 years to teach people how to cook um, and how to do it on a budget and do it well so that they can be a little bit more financially independent and have control over their diet and their budget. Very cool. Would you say that there was like a recipe that really went off and really helped launch your career? Um, yeah, probably my dragon noodles. It's it's not the healthiest one on the website, but I think it resonates with a lot of people because it's just super fast, easy, and um, satisfying. So it's just basically noodles with a sweet, spicy, salty sauce that has like, I think maybe like three ingredients. And there's so many ways you can alter the recipe. Like you can add shrimp, you can add chicken. The original recipe has eggs in it. Um, And it's just something that I think a lot of people can do. And when they realize, oh, I can cook this and it's really good, that inspires them to do more. So I think that's why it took off. Would you describe yourself as always having been a cook like did you grow up learning how to cook yeah well i thought i knew how to cook when i started this um yeah no i grew up in a big family there were seven of us so my mom was pretty much always in the kitchen um so i learned a lot just by being around her when i was growing up um and i think that instilled a lot of the food principles i have now which is just cooking from scratch um, is better for you and it's less expensive. And it also taught me that cooking can be a fun experience and um, it's a combination of my two favorite subjects, which is science and art. You know, it can be fun, but you also learn things because there's so much science stuff happening when you're cooking. So I think that's why I always loved it. And then through this 10 year experiment of having the blog, I've learned so much more. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like uh, when I think back on, um, cause my mother, uh, growing up, like uh, all of my memories of her in the kitchen, like yeah. she's a huge, huge cook. Um, and I just, when I look back and I see, uh, in my mind, you know, the time, like I would every night sit on the c- counter mm-hmm. while she was cooking and help her with things and stuff like that. And I feel like 
that is an experience that fewer and fewer people get as the years go on. And it's so funny because I think one of the things that I most got from that outside of just like learning a lot of the basics of cooking was a feeling of like if something gets messed up or something is imperfect, it's fine. Yeah. You know, you can always fix it. There's always something you can do to even it out. And like in the worst case scenario, when something really bad happens <laughs> in the kitchen, it's just food right. and you throw it away and you're like, okay, well, that was a disappointment and you order pizza. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it, it, that feeling of not panicking when something goes wrong mm-hmm. when cooking. Um, and of course, there are still times like I've gotten stressed out if I'm like hosting people and a sauce isn't coming together right or whatever, where you still get that panic. But for the most part, you just have this intrinsic confidence that I feel like people can only get from just doing it over and over again. Exactly. I think everything that I've learned in the past 10 years has been from my failures in the kitchen. So when a sauce curdles, you're like, what happened? And then you have to figure out what happened. And once you troubleshoot it and you understand why it happened, then you don't make that mistake ever again. And you can just do better in the kitchen, just like throwing stuff together, you know, on the whim the next time. Totally. What What are some dishes Uh, for people who didn't grow up with that and who didn't learn to cook kind of organically and by osmosis, what are some dishes that you would recommend they start out with just to start building that confidence? I would say probably a soup because you're Mm. literally just throwing things in a pot, adding some water or broth and boiling it. It doesn't take a lot of skill and it's almost always delicious. And very hard to mess up. Yeah. You just, it's, there's not a lot of technique that goes into it. It's so easy. Um, and maybe like roasting vegetables, I yeah. feel like. You know, that's another thing where you just put it in the oven, let it do its thing, and when it comes out, it's so delicious. And then totally. you can do so many things with that. One of the number one things that I'll make like at least once a week just to like f- force myself to consume a lot of vegetables in a delicious way is just a sheet pan mm-hmm. full of broccolini or broccoli or broccoli rabe, a trillion slices of garlic, <laughs> yeah. and just some olive oil, salt, and pepper. It's it's like nature's chips. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. So good. And it goes with basically any dish. Like That's the thing. I would say that the way I cook when I'm having people over is the way that I feel like would be easiest for most people to start is I almost always do something that's like braised or a sauce or something that, you know, can doesn't have to be babied Mm -hmm. and is really easy to fix if something goes wrong with it. And then a roasted vegetable or something that you just throw in the oven that you can do ahead of time. I feel like a lot of people don't realize that so many things, as many things as can be made ahead of time can be made ahead of time. Like that was an important discovery for me, especially with entertaining. Yeah. I think our culture is really obsessed with the word fresh. Right. Um, And so that prevents people from A, trying to cook things ahead of time. It prevents them from um, being interested in their leftovers. But I think what they don't realize is that most restaurants and food service places, they are batch cooking and making things ahead of time. Totally. And serving things over a few days because that's the only efficient way to do it. Um, Otherwise, they'll be losing money. So every time you think you're getting something fresh, you're probably not so don't be afraid to do that at home as well and also make sure that you can figure out as the maximal amount of things that can be done ahead of time because so much I feel like especially on a weeknight when you come home from work mm-hmm. or you know god forbid if you had to do something <laughs> after work and you're just like are, are you serious like I have to cook but the more things that are done for you especially if it's something like time sensitive you're like oh I have like these potatoes that I pre-peeled and they're in a bowl of cold water. And if mm-hmm. I don't do something with them tonight, I'm losing them. <laughs> yeah, give it but a just like give, <laughs> the most you can do to get yourself right to that place mm-hmm. where it's easy to cook, I feel like that would incentivize so many more people. I think it's that overwhelming feeling of like, I have to do it all, you know? Yeah. Or that food has to be really complicated. I really advocate for really simple meals. Like you were saying, a roasted vegetable, maybe two. Yeah. And a piece of meat, which doesn't have to be complicated to cook, throw it in a pan with some herbs and spices, and that's your meal. It's super simple, but it's really good. It's delicious. Really good. Also, I feel like I have at any given time like se- seven different pasta sauces yeah. in my freezer. Because here's the secret with pasta sauce. You defrost it, toss it with some fresh pasta. <laughs> it tastes literally identical and to the night fresh. that you made it. And it's fresh. <laughs> that's what the restaurants do. <laughs> literally identical to the night that you made it. Um, what is, what is a cuisine that you have like really not mastered, but you want to? 
So probably like authentic Asian dishes. I'm really right. good at the like Americanized the takeout, takeout. Yeah, I'm really good at that. But um, the authentic stuff is really intimidating to me. I think probably because yeah. there are some ingredients that are a little bit harder to find. I'm not sure how to use them right. Or if I do go to an international market to find the ingredients, I can't always read the labels. Um, so that's a little bit scary to me. Yeah, I have to shout them out. I was talking to Beth before we started filming about the walks of life, W-O-K-S. They're mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, it's actually a family that maintains this food blog together, but they have um, just an enormous amount of really authentic Chinese especially, but other um, Asian dishes as well. And super easy to follow, super step-by-step, -step, pictures for everything. And that has like single-handedly gotten me into yeah. feeling really confident, particularly with Szechuan cuisine. But, uh, yeah, I need um, to check it out because I did go to China last year and the food was so good. Where and in China were you? Um, I was in Shanghai. Nice. Yeah, it was awesome. Quite a, quite a food town. Yeah, it was amazing. I ate so much. <laughs> so much dim sum. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Do you still find cooking and recipe developing as fun now as you did 11 <laughs> years ago? I think yes. I mean, with any job, even if it's your passion, there are going to be days where you're like, I don't feel like doing this. Um, but it's such an artistic expression. I don't think I'm ever going to really get sick of it. You know, there's just so many possibilities to do so many different things. And when you do create something that is so much better than you thought it was going to be, or you're like, you find this magical taste combination, it's, it's just a really great feeling. And I don't think that's ever going to go away. What is something that you feel like most people get wrong when it comes to being in the kitchen? Um, I think the number one thing that people get wrong is they think if they follow a recipe to a T, that is guaranteed to work out. Right. Um, but there are just so many variables when you're cooking, whether it's um, the individual settings on your stovetop, your cookware, brand ingredients, um, all those things can make a difference in how a recipe turns out. So you're not going to cook like Julia Child the first you know, recipe out of the gate. Um, it's really some a skill you have to learn, and it's going to take failure and um, just trying over and over again. So don't be upset if something doesn't turn out the right way um, the first time. Use that as a learning experience and um, enjoy the process. Now this is a really inside baseball question. But can you confirm or deny that most food bloggers go on extremely long-winded tangents about their husbands <laughs> before they get to the recipe for primarily SEO purposes? Uh, I don't think it's primarily SEO purposes. There are some that do that. But originally, the reason people told stories in a food blog is because it's a blog. That's right. their online log of their experience. Yeah. So that's what it was for. And then the recipe was worked into that. Um, but now, yeah, people do add some extra text for SEO sometimes. <laughs> are you are you a big storyteller? I am a zero storyteller. Yes, I have Queen. been that way <laughs> since day one, and people have always thanked me for it. And the reason I am not a storyteller is because I don't like sharing my life with the world. That's why I don't do a lot of Instagram stories, things like that. I'm just a really private individual, so. I don't like telling my whole life before the recipe. I tell people what they need to know to make the recipe and just leave it at that. I do get tired of people complaining about that though because they're acting like someone's forcing them to scroll through all that. Here's the thing, the internet is full of choices. If you don't like what it's someone true, has on their true. website, go somewhere else, go to all recipes, go to the Food Network, get your recipe at the top totally. of the page. Don't complain to that person about what's on their own website. That is their space. That's true, <laughs> that's true. And I yeah. will say shout out to Walks of Life because similar to Beth here, very low on the unrelated anecdotes prior to getting to the recipe. Uh, that's funny. But I will say you were saying earlier, I asked you um, about the drama, the drama <laughs> in the food blogger community. Yeah. And you were saying it's a community that can be a bit rife with drama. Yeah, it can. Um, you know, I, what do I want to say about that? I don't, I don't participate in it. I see it from afar sometimes. Um, it, I don't know. What is a way, because I know a lot of, you were saying that one of the biggest issues is that often recipes can be sort of lifted in a way that's like, you're not really giving credit to the person who inspired this. What is a good way that a person who wants to support a particular blogger can be a huge support to that blogger and make sure that their recipes are getting the love? Um, just, you know, give them a shout out whenever you can share their, um, their content, 
by using the share button, um, not by copying and pasting the entire recipe into your Facebook post or your Instagram account. Um, share cool. the actual links to their content, and that is the best. And way. tag them on social media. Yeah, and I'd tag say, them mm -hmm. uh, when you're when you're doing it. Yeah. Although I will say it's really funny. Like I have a I I feel like my my personal following on Instagram is like borderline hostile to me anytime <laughs> I post food. Which by the way, guys, this is a call out. Every single time I post something that I've made, like people get actively angry at me in the like comments that I'm not sharing a recipe, literally to the point that multiple people will be like, if you're not gonna post a recipe, you really shouldn't even post a photo of it. And I'm like, I'm sorry lady that I'm literally living <laughs> my life. But to be fair, anytime, cause like a lot of times, I mean, I'm sure you can relate to this, half the time it's no, there's no recipe. Right. Like I'm just like putting things in a pan that I had in my cabinet and it would be dishonest of me to try and relay that and also would probably come out bad because I don't measure anything. Right. So I'm like about this much that whatever. But anytime I do do a recipe from a food blogger, always give them a shout out. Thank you. And then half the time <laughs> the commenters are like, who made this? And I'm like, read, read the yes. post. No one ever reads the original post. They look at the picture, then ask the question, even though it's been answered in the post. <laughs> yes, totally. I don't know. But I will say, though, that the one thing that we talk about a lot uh, on TFD with regards to food is really to that point, it's like the vast majority of dishes that you're gonna cook are not recipes. Because mm -hmm. if you cooked based on a specific recipe every single time you made dinner, it would be so expensive. It's not realistic to go out and get a brand new set of ingredients for everything you're gonna cook. I would say at least half the time, you're just gonna be like, what do I have on hand? And what can be something delicious? So like to that point, are there any like go-to dishes that you think everyone should like have in their arsenal because it can make use of a lot of their different ingredients? Yeah, uh, I recently wrote an article about six ways to use leftover vegetables and it's kind of similar to that concept. So these are recipes that can take basically whatever you have left over in your kitchen and you can use that to make your dinner. So things like stir fries, you can throw anything into a stir fry. Um, mm. A pizza, you can put anything on top of a pizza. You know, a pasta salad, you especially can put- Especially pineapple. Yeah. <laughs> especially pineapple or not if you don't have it you don't like it use something else use what you have um you know pasta dishes you can throw anything into pasta um things like that you quiche know? i feel like quiche, quiche yeah. is my number frittatas, one frittatas things like that also quiche freezes surprisingly well yeah. a lot of people wouldn't think so but yeah. it freezes well also i feel like not enough people make use of frozen food like yeah. frozen vegetables frozen fruits there are so many like especially in the winter when stuff is out of season, like mm -hmm. uh, frozen vegetables should always be on hand. Yeah, that's one of my biggest things. And someone had asked about that on Twitter. They said how to um, shop for vegetables um, and stock up. Frozen vegetables are the best because you don't have to use them right away. You can use part of the bag. They're not gonna spoil. Um, they're always already chopped and everything, so it's less work for you. Um, and you can literally throw them into anything. So I always keep frozen spinach. Mm -hmm. um, I love putting that in pretty much everything I eat, even smoothies. Um, frozen broccoli is another good one. Peas are awesome because those are pretty high protein. Um, and you can just like, literally put them in whatever you're eating to up the vegetable content and it's so cheap. I feel like that really ties into what you were saying earlier about people having this really bad notion of fresh yeah. being so important because like, first of all, half of those vegetables are frozen at the point of picking. So yeah. actually have a higher nutritional value than, you know, something that's been on a truck for a month. Exactly. Before it got to the grocery <laughs> it's store. like not even remotely in season. <laughs> yeah. um, but also more importantly, the goal should be to integrate more of these foods into your diet in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be realistic financially or even logistically for people to get fresh produce every day, mm -hmm. but you can have access these things in your freezer whenever you need them. Yep. Also, I feel like a lot of the frozen, I feel like frozen vegetable technology has gotten pretty good now. Like a lot of them are, even if they're the steamers in the bag, they, they're pretty good. Yeah. And they're doing all sorts of other things. Like you can get the spiralized vegetables now. Um, the, and I, The like risottoed ones. Yeah. There's so many more options. So um, there's a lot to, if you haven't checked out your freezer section, definitely check that out. But I would stay away from the ones that come already in a sauce and everything. Yeah. No, those are bad. Um, Cause you don't know what's in there. You can make a sauce with those ingredients like really easy yourself. Yeah. You know, and totally. Um, 
they probably cost more. And also, you can make a sauce, like a, you know, some kind of a butter, cheese, herb whatever, or yeah. whatever. You can make that and then freeze it in little cubes. Yeah. And then you have your go-to sauce. Well, you know what? You mentioned that we did have some questions on Twitter. And uh, let me tell you, the people came out. <laughs> Yay. They have some questions. <laughs> Thanks so, for the questions. Yes. These are all from you guys. Um, so I'm just going to go through them. This one might be a dramatic and or controversial one. Ooh. But I'm ready for you to go off. I'm ready. <laughs> Thoughts on box meal plans like Green Chef, Blue Apron, etc. <sighs> go off, Beth. Go off. Okay, okay. Let me at least try to get some pros in here. Like some, there's got to be something good about them, right? Okay. So I think maybe it might be helpful to get someone over the hurdle, the intimidation of cooking. A gateway drug to cooking. Yeah, a gateway drug to cooking. But in general, I just feel like there's so much packaging. Oh, so much packaging um, totally. that I just can't get behind them. And I feel like there you could just buy the five ingredients that you need for so much less money at the store. Yes. But I think what it's doing, what pe people like about them so much, is it's telling people exactly what needs to be done to cook this meal and breaking it down so it's easy. Um, so I think that's the attraction. But practicality, I don't, I just don't think it's there. Yeah, I think yeah. it's it's definitely something that should be used as a gateway point into cooking. And mm -hmm. I can totally see someone who has never cooked, who wants to get there, using it for several months to like get them over that hump. Yeah. But on a long-term basis, totally yeah. unsustainable yeah. financially. And also I feel like one of the most important elements with cooking um, in a long-term way is being adaptable, responsive, mm -hmm. imaginative, you know, being creative with what you have. Yeah. And this really does not develop that skill. Like, no, it doesn't. I, I know people who've like gotten hooked on them and now they're like, if they don't have their blue apron, they're like, well, I How do can't cook. Yeah. How does this work? I also feel like the other thing is that like what they'll do often is they'll give you like a tablespoon spoon of fresh ginger and it's mm -hmm. like it is unsustainable to believe that you could buy that quantity of fresh <laughs> ginger like you have to get to a place where you're like okay I have a huge chunk of ginger now what else can I do with it and it's yeah. like you could do a lot with it but only if you take that step to learn what to do with the ingredient mm -hmm. um, because it's rare that you'll be able to buy to the exact proportion exactly. that you need something yeah um, I was saying earlier that one of the hardest parts about getting before we were filming, that one of the hardest parts of getting into any new kind of cuisine is you have to buy this one thing that you're like, oh, crap, now I have, like, you know, mm -hmm. a huge amount of turmeric. What the hell <laughs> am I supposed to do with turmeric? Uh, and unless you force yourself to really learn what to do with it, yeah. it's, uh, cooking is going to be extremely wasteful. Yeah. Um, and people don't realize this, but even, like, spices go bad. Yeah. Uh, but one way to combat that um, is find a place that you can buy your spices in bulk. That way you can buy just a tablespoon of your yep. turmeric or whatever. Um, so that helps. can't really do that with sauces and things, mm. um, but for spices, that's oil's a good option. also hard. Yeah, oil is hard. Um, mm -hmm. For those of us who can't always make it to the grocery store, what are the top items to stock our pantries with other than the classics like pastas and rice? Um, so yeah, pasta and rice, obviously. Um, canned beans, I think, are really good. Mm. Um, or dry beans, if you prefer to cook them from dry, because that can be a little bit less expensive, but it does take a little bit Love more Love a canned bean. Yeah, canned bean. Uh, canned tomatoes are great. I use those in all sorts of things from mm -hmm. soups to pastas and everything. Um, and then just make sure that you have the basic like oils and vinegars and spices, because if you have those, you can make any sauce, any dressing that you need, and then you have plenty of options. Totally. We yeah. actually, to shout out our own channel, we had a video we did forever ago about like 19 ingredients you'll always want in a kitchen mm -hmm. things like mustard yeah. olive oil basic spices i always think you should have garlic and onion on yeah. hand because <laughs> half the time when you're like this is great what's in it it's garlic, garlic and, and onion, onion. <laughs> every recipe starts that way yeah. i have a friend who is like uh her her mom hates the taste of garlic and onions and won't eat anything that contains it and i was like she needs to get like a lobotomy what There's does she no eat <laughs> what no good left? food no good food Very a lot of people friend. don't realize like when i met my husband 10 years ago almost he ketchup was spicy to him well and now he like he'll go to a Szechuan place and turn it up to level ten, level ten and just nice. be just crying and love it. And <laughs> but I'm like, loving it. <laughs> anyone can learn. It hurts so good. <laughs> it hurts so good. And people who don't get into spicy food, you should train yourself because once you actually <laughs> like spicy food, it's like a whole other category of flavor. Yeah. And there's all different nuanced, different kinds. Like, you know, something like a really spicy curry has almost nothing in common with like a really spicy, like, you know, Szechuan paste. It's yeah. A whole new world out there. 
Are there any underground tips to keep protein and heartiness in our I haven't eaten a fresh item in weeks meal? That That is a really confusingly phrased question. Yeah, I think I'm confused about the question. Um, are they looking for shelf-stable protein sources? I think shelf-stable protein and heartiness. Like, let's say this is like a clinical depression meal where you're like, you can barely, because that's the thing. Like, people can like barely get okay. themselves to like even boil a pack of noodles. What are like really easy, really intuitive? I guess canned beans would be a yeah, good one. Yeah, so canned beans, um, nuts. So nuts. any sort of Handful nut mix. Of nuts. Although that might be a little bit more expensive. But this is another situation where I would lean heavily on the frozen foods. Totally. Yeah, so you can keep chicken breasts, you can keep fish fillets, you can keep shrimp in your freezer. And they're so quick to cook. Totally. You ground know? meats, very yeah, good ground for meat, a quick cook. All of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cheese also. Oh, yeah. Cheese. Cheese. I, I freeze my cheese all the cheese time. Cheese and too. eggs, man. Protein. Oh, yeah. Protein. And eggs, like, last forever. I don't totally. know. They, they have expiration dates, but no. they're just in my fridge all the time. <laughs> totally. And you can put, I mean, there are so many things you can put an, put an egg on. Yeah, that's my unofficial slogan is put an egg on it. Because I the put best. an egg on everything. Yeah. Hell yeah. My, like, yeah. number one dinner um, that I make when I'm, like, tired at the end of the day and don't feel like dealing with it but want something yummy is these um, Korean, the Samyang, Samyang, whatever, uh, Korean noodles. And you just doctor them up. You put, yep. you know, corn, bok choy, bamboo shoots, some eggs. Whatever vegetables whatever you, you have, have on it. Fridge. And it's yeah. so easy and so delicious. Yeah. What is the best way to shop for vegetables? I guess we discussed this. But to mm -hmm. clarify how to shop and stock up vegetables so they don't spoil. Yeah, Gotta so utilize yeah, like we mentioned earlier, utilize frozen. The other thing I would like to mention with that is lean heavily on the vegetables that are um, a little bit more sturdy. So these are going to be things like um, your carrots, cabbage, celery, onions, potatoes, and sweet potatoes, um, because those can stay in your kitchen for a while without spoiling, and then you can just have them on hand. And because they are more stable and don't spoil as easily, those are usually the less expensive vegetables of totally. well, because they're not gonna have to be spoiled out by the manufacturer or the store or whatever. Nice. Yeah. This is uh, kind of a diversion, but do you actually cook all of the food that you put on your blog? Yeah. And you actually eat it? Yeah. <laughs> Man. Yeah, I mean, I only do uh, like two to three recipes a week, so it's enough for my boyfriend and I. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're not like cooking for a, a huge group. It's so funny. Like mm -hmm. every single time I, po I post a dish, nine times out of 10, it's a lot of it. And they're like, why do you cook so much food? Doesn't it go bad? And I'm like, people, <laughs> how many times do I have to say I use my freezer? Like, yeah. what is, like, ah, uh, it's so funny. But like, the thing is that I would never. I couldn't survive if I didn't freeze the the vast yeah. majority, majority of what I make. Like, there's no way. There's no way. Like, I consider myself a person who cooks a lot, and that's like three nights a week. Right. That's a lot. Yeah. You know? I mean, otherwise I would have literally no hobbies or other activities <laughs> because I would just be coming home every night and, you know, especially in New York where you have to, like, walk home from the grocery store. That in and of itself. Yeah. I don't think I could do that. When we did the TFD book, there's one chapter that we have that's entirely about like um, food and home cooking because that's mm -hmm. obviously a huge part of people's budgets. And even just working on the 10 basic recipes that we included in that, like I was like, I never want to see another pan <laughs> again. Has being a recipe creator and a food blogger professionally, has it changed your relationship to food? Um, a little bit. I really, I think I more fully understand the significance of it in people's lives because the feedback I get from people who um, have learned to cook using my website is just so overwhelming. You know, they, they talk about how it's not only changed their finances, but it's changed their health. So even just going from eating out all the time to cooking one or two nights at home is really changing people's lives. Um, you know, their health is better. They waste less and just like seeing how all these different areas of their lives are impacted by that um, it really drives home how how much food is part of our culture and everybody's culture totally yeah it's not an afterthought I think that's another thing that our culture is kind of like um, moved towards where like eating is just something on the side and that's why everyone goes out to eat because they don't have time to think about it you know it's just uh, it's not part of their their daily lives but when you start to make it more of a focus in your life like make that your quality time that's your you time something that you're doing for yourself um it really changes a lot totally my favorite thing in the world is when i'm bopping around my kitchen with an episode of the real housewives on my laptop which is yeah. perched on my counter and i'm like it's so funny because i feel like in movies it's always like the married couple is like in the kitchen together like whatever and i'm like <laughs> 
get out. Like, this is my space. This is my <laughs> zone. I get to completely zone out and just be all about, like, such a tactile, yeah. you know, you really, it's meditative. It is. It is. And it can be great, like, quality time with your husband or whatever, you not know? Not for me. <laughs> not, maybe not for everybody. <laughs> but, like, you know, I mean, that's one of my memories growing up is being in the kitchen with my mother. And yeah, I, didn't, I do love I didn't it realize mom. at the time, but... Um, you know, it's a big part of people's lives. And so instead of thinking about it like a chore, something you have to do, find a way to make it fun. Crack totally. a bottle of wine, turn on some music, you know, make it a good time. Totally. I yeah. Now, let me be let me give credit where credit is due to my husband. He is uh, always offering to help. He's very <laughs> much the dishwasher. Mm. Very, like, he definitely plays his role. But he's like, I mean, I always say that like my husband, like you'd be better off sending a golden retriever with a basket on its back to the grocery <laughs> store because he will come home with like the most like somehow he will find a way to misunderstand a grocery item yeah. in a completely fatal way. Like one time I was like, could you bring me home a, like a half pound of prosciutto? You would think. <laughs> That that is intuitively understood as sliced prosciutto. Oh no! Did he no, bring him a leg? He brought home a quarter pound chunk of prosciutto, and I was like, "Does it look like I have a deli slicer <laughs> in my kitchen? What am I gonna do with this?" Yeah. And he was like, "So we tried to bring it back to the grocery store. They're like, homie, we can't put that thing that you brought home back onto the deli slicer.' Like." So he's, he really means well. Yeah. But like, if you're like, please chop this vegetable, he'll manage to chop it in a way that it's not even cookable anymore. <laughs> oh, like no. he's, I love you, Mark, but the kitchen is not your zone. Yeah. Well, at least he does the dishes. That's something. Always does the dishes. <laughs> and he's like, and he loves, like a lot of men do, I think, the sort of like science experiment thing. So like, I always get him like books on like fermentation yeah. and he makes his little his little concoctions, but yeah, definitely don't put that man in charge of dinner. <laughs> you have to leave him with like tons of frozen portioned out food or otherwise he literally will just eat like pretzels and beef jerky every single night. <laughs> he knows night. how to operate the microwave, you're safe. <laughs> He's got the microwave under control. What do people not know about the finances of being a food blogger? Um, that it can be really expensive. And I'm not talking about the food. Um, just running the website yeah. is very costly. And the bigger it gets, the more it costs. Do you ha do you do your own photography? Yes, I do. Um, and I suppose that's expensive as well. Cameras can be expensive. But just the, the cost of keeping the website on the internet, <laughs> you yeah. know, server space alone is so expensive. Because it's so image heavy. Yeah, it's image heavy. Um, and then just like every little piece of the website that you see is from another plugin and every plugin costs money or has a subscription cost. Um, even just sending out my free weekly newsletter costs hundreds of dollars a month, you wow. know? So um, think about that next time you're complaining about ads. <laughs> totally. So would you say that like, yeah, it's like thousands of dollars a month oh, just yeah. to keep the digital yeah. space going? Mm -hmm. Wow. It's really intense. I will say though that I feel like one of the nice things that um, a lot of food blogging has uh, taught people um, in terms of, you know, it, it's really democratized food, I think, in a way mm. that, like, even 10 years ago, I feel like there was, you know, Bon Appetit magazine yeah. and Julia Child, and then there was everyone else. Right. And I feel like what's nice is that now there's this feeling of, like, so many different people from so many walks of life can have, uh, you know, a, 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 like a part to play in how we think about food. And I really like that because I feel like there's, for example, when I follow you or when I follow the walks of life or something, like I feel like I'm getting a perspective on food that's a lot more relatable mm -hmm. to my mm -hmm. own. Like I love, I subscribe to Bon Appetit and I love it, but I'll be honest, sometimes it makes me feel bad about my own kitchen. I'm like, wow, I really don't have any of this fancy stuff. Yeah. I don't know how to do these fancy things. And I like that idea. Yeah. And I think that was born out of need. You yeah. know, no one knew how to cook. And so they needed to see that it was approachable. And I think decades ago, people like, you know, housewives would be trading recipe cards, but that doesn't really happen anymore. So people need to see it's approachable in a different way. And even the big sites like Bon Appetit are um, kind of getting in on that game. They have a new uh, side shoot called Base. Basically, I think mm. that's them, where it's just like really simple food that's approachable, yeah, totally. um, but still really tasty. There was this article, I actually don't think it was in one of the food magazines, but it was in like the food section of like the Times or something that was like this person being like, 
just really hating Aperol and was like, the Aperol spritz is like disgusting. It's like, <laughs> you know, she's like naming her favorite bitters and or the, her favorite um, aperitivos that she puts in her spritzes. And she's like, my bar card is always stocked with like blah, 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 blah. These like crazy Italian aperitivos you've never heard of. And I'm like, I just feel worse about myself that I like an Aperol spritz now. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like it just, I feel like there's a certain kind of food writing and a way of talking about food that is almost like exclusionary on purpose, yeah, which I really feel like I greatly dislike. Yeah. And you know who else I think um, helped kind of bring food back into a more approachable zone is Anthony Bourdain. Totally. Because he, you know, he was like a, a world-class chef, but he also loved like street food mm. and, you know, just really like junk food, basically. Yeah. Although I must yeah. take umbrage with one of his comments, <laughs> which I will never forget, where he was like, the single most disgusting thing I've ever eaten. And I have seen this man eat some, some, some real disgusting things on camera. He said it was a chicken McNugget. And I'm like, you know that you're saying that for effect. There's no way it was a chicken McNugget. Like, I've seen you eat bugs on TV. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I'd rather eat a bug than a chicken McNugget. <laughs> not me. I'll eat a chicken McNugget for free. <laughs> I mean, listen. I'm sure. OK, when you think about what the chicken McNugget represents, sure. I think but, it's one of those things you have to grow up eating to like. <laughs> you never got fast food as a kid? No, we never did. I mean, wow. maybe like once in a great while. While, but never same did. but that made it such a treasured like yeah. experience I just didn't ever develop a taste for it I guess what should I do when I start budgeting for food um so I think the very first thing that anyone should do is uh take temperature of what they're spending now so right. take two weeks at least better if it's four log all of your food expenses between both eating out and groceries because mm. that makes a big difference and see what your starting point is because you're going to need motivation to keep going once you do start budgeting and you won't have that motivation if you don't know where you started um luckily it's really easy to do that nowadays there are like so many apps that you can just like connect it to your bank account and it mm. will automatically categorize everything for you totally. so like mint i think is one um i'm sure there's a bunch of others but um do that for a little while Figure out what you're spending now. That way, once you start saving even a little bit, you're gonna be so proud of yourself and you're gonna be like, yeah, I can do even more. You know, I'm gonna cut it in half and people do. So. Do you use a budgeting app? Yeah, I do use Mint. <laughs> well, guys, you know what's so crazy? <laughs> Mint. <laughs> So as Beth mentioned, one of the absolute best products to get all of your budgeting under control is something called Mint. I have been using Mint personally for like seven years now. And basically what it does is it links up with your bank accounts and your cards to help synthesize and visualize and understand all of your budget. It will sort all of the different purchases that you're making into nice categories and make a beautiful little pie chart for you. It will send you updates and little warnings when you're going way over budget budget in a certain category or your spending habits are different for a certain month. Basically, it just helps you manage and control your own budget in a way that's easy to understand and doesn't require a ton of heavy lifting. I am definitely one of those people who's not really capable of doing like an Excel sheet budget for my actual expenses every single month. So Intuit does all of that difficult work for me and allows me to just see my budget at a glance and make sure that I'm on target for all of my different spending categories and I'm hitting my different savings goals every month. I personally love Mint and could not recommend it more. So check it out at the link in our description and get started mastering your budget today. What foods does she enjoy at restaurants without even trying to recreate at home? I can't say there's anything that I haven't tried to recreate. Or that you're like, this is not worth recreating at home. Okay, so one thing that I prefer to eat at restaurants instead of eating at home is pho. Um, oh, good one. Yeah, because, I mean, the to get the pho broth correct, mm. it takes hours. You have to cook that stuff for like a day and a half, you totally. know, like to get it really good. And I'm not going to do that at home. You know, it's just not cost effective, especially with all the toppings that you have to have on it. When I can go to an authentic Vietnamese place, get a huge bowl the size of my head for seven bucks, I'm not going to try to do that at home. Totally. Yeah, so that, probably like um, Indian cuisine too. Yeah. Most of that, just because it does require so many different spices, and I don't think I cook it enough to make use of those. So yeah. I'd rather just get it at a restaurant. 
My number one thing for me is like, I feel like anytime I try to make shellfish that's just like the item, like cooking a lobster at home mm-hmm. or a pot of mussels, not only does it cost almost exactly the same <laughs> price just because it's really expensive to mm-hmm. get fresh fish um, and fresh shellfish in particular, but I feel like it's so easy to mess up. And I'm like, I don't want to take that risk with $25 worth of mussels. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, you need to know what you're doing. Before really you need to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and I feel like sometimes it's good. And there are certain dishes like, uh, you know, get a fresh tin of uh, crab meat, make a nice crab cake, crab, like there are mm-hmm. things you can do. Yeah. Or like s- shellfish pasta can be good at home. But like, I don't know, man, it's, it's a big risk to like do your own lobster at yeah. home. Yeah, for sure. The full thing. And I have messed up a pot of mussels on more occasions than I can count. Yeah, I haven't attempted that one yet, but I do love mussels. One minute too long in those pots mm. and they're, they're, they're done. rubbery and gross. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the same price as getting them out. And it's so nice. Like you go to a restaurant, you get like your big pot of mussels and some yeah. fries. And... I wouldn't try to recreate the, the stuff that's an experience. Totally. Anything you know? experiential. Yeah. You don't want to do. I do meal prep. This is the person, not me. I don't meal prep. I do meal prep, but I'm feeling like I'm just eating the same thing all the time. How do I change it up without wasting food and still saving money? Um, first, I think you do do meal prep and you don't realize it. You said you freeze a lot of your uh, you, oh, you true. batch cooking. And fr- That's meal prep. Um, so That's ever- true. So everyone who's afraid of doing meal prep, just even like saving your leftovers for a couple days and eating that, that's meal prep. Someone was like, meal prep is gentrified leftovers. Yeah, it basically is. It's the same thing. It's just now <laughs> we have a fancy term for it. Um, like I don't meal prep more than four days at a time because like the commenter was saying, they don't want to eat the same thing forever. Um, but one way you can kind of mix it up is make sure that you're meal prepping some freezable stuff. So totally. what I do is I every time I have like a big batch of super stew or something I make sure at least a few portions of that gets into the freezer so that when I do have my four-day meal prep um, and I'm like eh, I don't feel like eating that again today I can grab something out of the freezer mm. and switch it up for a day or two so it's kind of like building your own stock of TV dinners nice yeah I will say also as a hot food take uh, playing off that the, it's always the saddest looking chicken breasts on those meal preps and I feel like 99% of the time if you're cooking with chicken breasts you should just be cooking with chicken thigh because it's less expensive, more versatile, and in my opinion, tastes better. Yeah, totally. And I don't know why, but a lot of meal preppers think they have to boil their meat. I don't know if they're trying to avoid using fat, but I mean, at least oh, bake it or something. Like but grill it or... I saw oh. somebody boiling um, ground turkey the other day on some documentary, and like, that's the most disgusting thing that I've ever so seen gross. in my like life. That is so gross. Like half of what... Oh my God, I have a, such a pet peeve. Can I share? With <laughs> anytime I see like those... People are obsessed with their crock pots and their instant pots or whatever, and fine, I get it. Like, it's, it does make for convenience. But anytime I see people loading all the ingredients at the exact same time, totally <laughs> raw, into the bottom of that pot, I'm like, where's the meat being seared? Yeah. Like, where are no you caramelizing? Reaction? <laughs> no Maillard re- reaction. Like, you're not caramelizing any of yeah. your onions or your garlic. Like, where's your depth of flavor? Yeah, that's my Gross. biggest gripe with the slow cooker. Like, yeah, the slow cooker is great for a few things, but I do not recommend cooking everything in the slow cooker all the time. A, a lot of times it's just going to be faster and easier to do it on the stovetop. Same with the Instant Pot, in my opinion. Um, but B, you need that dry heat environment to create the caramelization, the Maillard reaction, all those things um, that you cannot get in the wet environment of a slow cooker or pressure cooker. It's just like everything is just moist. Yeah, and if you ever see a food blogger or other some um, other food website that has a picture of a slow cooked meal and things are browned in there, they're lying. You, oh, totally. You cannot get things browned in a slow cooker. Not if it's just going straight in there. No. Um, you have to, you know, sear it first. I feel like yeah. it's so funny, like people, Here's fun fact, when you're cooking something and it's not like get like mushrooms, for example, and they come out all gross, it's usually because they did not have enough space yeah. in the pan. So they basically steamed themselves yeah. instead of getting that delicious brown. Like, I feel like so much of what's good about food is, is, brown. just, is browning it. <laughs> One of my pet peeves is if I'm at a restaurant or something and they ask if I want the bagel or toast toasted and they bring it to me warm. No. But not toasted. There's like no browning on it. Just at like all. breathe like, really hard on it. Yes. Which ingredients are worth getting high quality and which one should I just stick to the cheap options? I'm thinking staples like rice, beans, mm-hmm. pasta sauce, etc. Our food budget for two in Canada is about 70 Canadian dollars a week, and I want to make it stretch as far as possible. 
I love that question. And I've been wanting to write an article about this lately, things that I spend more on. Um, so the things that I like to spend a little bit more on are a good pasta, because even mm. when you get the fancy pasta, it's still inexpensive. Yes. <laughs> and it just makes such a difference. The way that the pasta is textured on the outside, if it's a good pasta, will hold mm -hmm. the sauce better. Um, and it just somehow tastes so much better. You wouldn't think that a pasta can taste different, but it does. May, may I inject a small pasta yeah. hot take? Always, always Dikeko over Barilla. Barilla <laughs> pasta is yeah. terrible, and Dikeko is actually pretty good for yeah. the price point. It is good. That's all. Yeah. Um, since I'm so obsessed with eggs, I prefer to get better eggs. Mm. Um, Love an egg. Yeah, I've been using like good eggs for years, and one day I went back to the just the regular like cheapest one that's available at the supermarket, and like the shell like just disintegrated, like it just was not even. Mm. There's like no shell. It was weird. I don't know. So I definitely like a better egg. Um, and again, they're still inexpensive compared mm -hmm. to most of your other ingredients. So I allow myself to do that. Um, recently, I have been spending a little bit more on butter. So Kerrygold or bust from yeah, Wong. I have fallen so in love with Kerrygold and I didn't even know butter could be that different. Mm. It tastes different. Mm -hmm. The texture is different. It's like a whole different product. So um, yeah, I'm going to say butter. My, my husband, he loves like once a year, we'll do like a very, very nice Michelin starred restaurant. And mm -hmm. I'm not like as into the tasting menu type thing. Like yeah. I go with him, but he loves it. But the part that we both love the most is the bread cart with the fresh, soft, mm. homemade butter. It's, oh my God. Yeah, that's your meal. Like, I would be happy with a baguette and some butter for dinner. Oh my God. A baguette with some butter? Yeah. Oh, or maybe a little fresh jam, maybe, for dessert? Yeah. Mm. What ingredients are basically interchangeable? Like, here where I live, it's pretty hard to find things like kale or quinoa, which are popular now. So it would be good to know what things generally could replace them. Um, is he asking about those two ingredients specifically? She is asking she, she. Um, about, I think, those ingredients specifically, but I think maybe like more generally even categories of things that are pretty interchangeable. Oh, uh, I think that's tough because I think it's mostly going to depend on how they're being used in the recipe. Right, right. Yeah, so like um, a lot of times you can replace tomatoes with another acidic fruit like pineapple. Mm. Um, and that's why people like pineapple on their pizza, if you're that type of person. Um, Which I am. Or you can make a salsa with pineapple or, mm. um, you know, other fruit that has a little bit of acidity in it. Um, as far as greens go, kale, you can probably replace with something like collard green or mustard greens because they are also both really hearty, bitter greens. Um, but a lot of times you can even just use spinach in place of kale. You have to add it at a different point in the recipe because it's a lot more delicate. But yeah. I tell people spinach all the time in my recipes when they don't like kale. So that's definitely one. Um, not sure. What was the other one they asked about? Quinoa? Quinoa. I feel like brown rice. Yeah, probably. quinoa. Probably brown rice is going to be your least expensive, most convenient option there. Totally. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge, I put basically in every soup I make, I put a leafy green just yeah. because they're A, like you cannot mess them up. And also like they hold the soup really well. Yeah. So it's like a delicious bite of greeny. It gives it body, like something totally. to actually chew on. Yeah, and I feel yeah. like co I, collard greens are good. Mm -hmm. yep. Chard, mm -hmm. Swiss chard. I love my greens. I am a bitter flavor person. Me too. And like I'm a glad about it. Rob. Yeah. Oh man, I don't know how to phrase it exactly, but I wonder about her model of pricing things by meal and ingredient, and how she was able to conceive of food that way. Since most people just think about how much groceries cost versus how much it would cost to eat out for that same meal. That's a great question. It so. Is. For those of you who don't know, um, my background, my first college degree was in nutritional science um, because I was planning on becoming a dietitian. Um, a large portion of dietitians go on to manage large food service operations like um, hospital, kitchens, school, lunch programs, prison lunch programs. Obviously, I didn't want to do that. So, um, But anyway, we ended up having to take a lot of classes in food service management. Um, and so a big part of that is learning how to cost out the meals in those organizations. So I use the same method at home. So basically, you figure out the cost of the portion of the ingredient that you're using in the recipe, assuming that the rest of the cost of that item that you bought is going to be accounted for in other recipes. Right. So that's why I use that method. A lot of people find it to be inaccurate because they're like, oh, but I can't just buy one tablespoon of olive oil um, for this recipe. But if you think about it, you're not, the olive oil, when you use it the next time, that's not free. So it's not like you're, you know, you, if you already have it, 
Right. You know, so you just you account for the portion that you're using in the recipe. Um, and I do have a blog post about how to calculate your recipe costs. Uh, I think it's a really important exercise for people to try at least once because it can be very eye opening to see how different ingredients can really change the overall cost mm. of your recipe. So like if you add one extra ounce of cheese, all of a sudden your recipe cost is double. So yeah, um, I recommend people do it at least once just to kind of figure out. And I have a tutorial on how to do that. Totally. We'll link you guys to that in the description in the show notes. By the way, I'd like to add, now that you've brought it up, uh, if you're using it um, like to in any way, like as a uh, uncooked, basically, I, I always spend more on olive oil. Yeah. Yeah. Olive oil is another one of those. Olive oil. You really notice the difference. Yeah. I mean, a good olive oil to me tastes like flowers. It's so good. It is so good. <laughs> yeah. I, so yeah. Good. I love the, Cal- I think it's California Farms. Mm-hmm. It's in that square green bottle. I feel like for the price, it's like, it's a pretty decent price, but it's really good. Tasting. The um, 365 brand olive oils well, are yeah. really good too, and those are a really good price. Yeah. Yeah. Or what is your, this was uh, not asked, but I know that if certain people had been online when I asked them to ask questions, this would have been a really popular <laughs> one because um, we get so many comments about Trader Joe's stuff. Do you have any go to <laughs> Trader Joe's products that you love? I don't. I never get to go to Trader Joe's because it's like on the other opposite side of the world for me, and their parking lot gives me anxiety. So. <laughs> Like last time I went, I drove there. I'm like, I'm going to Trader Joe's today. And I took one look in the parking lot and I kept driving. (laughs) I'm like, I can't deal with that. I don't know why their parking lots are so bad. But I'm an Aldi girl. Um, And Aldi is like the the brother company to Trader Joe's. Mm. And I have one really close to my house. So I'm Mm. in Aldi all the time. I feel like, and I feel like the video that I watched that explains Trader Joe's business practices, I think has a section about this, but produce, not their strong suit, mm-hmm. fresh produce. Like and it's all wrapped in plastic. Yes. That's and it's, they rarely have a very good selection. A lot of times it's very low quality. Um, although I will say uh, they often have, they usually will have Persian cucumbers, mm-hmm. which are effing delicious. Those are good. Delicious. Okay. They're bulk nuts always at an excellent price mm-hmm. and they have delicious flavors like they have their Thai chili cashews not only could I use the like eat them by the handful constantly but they're also you can do interesting things with them they're great on a salad yeah. like things like that love those their frozen food section second to none mm. they have the best frozen foods they have delicious frozen soup dumplings they have frozen all kinds of and they're very good also for like um for example, Indian cuisine. They have great frozen Indian food. They have great frozen food of all of those categories. Um, but I feel like their their strongest suit has got to be the, the the prepared foods. They're the best place to get things to like have an easy go to dinner. Yeah, the fun convenience foods. I just remembered I do have a favorite Trader Joe's yes, product. Sure. Yeah, because actually before I was in Nashville, I was in New Orleans, and they had just opened one up um, shortly before we moved, so we did go there. It was easier, um, and we really enjoyed their pork um, pot stickers. Mm, the frozen, yes. frozen, the ones that come in the back. Yeah, of so you can yes. keep them in the freezer. We would just like take out six, 12 at a time, cook them up. Oh, yes. Super fast dinner. Loved them. That is like one of the number one things that I do anytime I make a, an, um, like a Chinese takeout-esque dish at home, which I love to do. Yeah. I always uh, heat up some frozen pot stickers to go with it. Yeah. That is one of those foods that never in this long life of mine am I going to make <laughs> homemade soup dumplings. And I have made pot stickers by hand for the blog before, and I would rather get the Trader Joe's. I feel like that, that there's no way they're not coming out worse. <laughs> and they're so inexpensive to buy already made. Totally. It's like, you might as well, you know? Yeah. yeah. I have, I, I, ooh, question. What's your take on making homemade pasta? Um, I don't do it. Me either. It's just, I not mean, worth it's, it. It's fun for like if you want to do a fun date night or something yeah. and like have that be the experience, but I'm not going to do that on a regular basis. Can you give us like your top three recipes from your collection that people should check out to get themselves into cooking at home? I think your dragon noodles might be one yeah. of them. Yeah, dragon noodles, um, the um, easy cauliflower and chickpea masala. Um, I said I didn't. I know. I, I, I said I didn't try to do Indian food, but this is again, it's more of like a takeout, fake out version, Americanized version. Um, so that and let's see a third one. I feel like there's a soup. Oh, um, West African peanut soup. Love. It's so good, and it's, it's so like good. unexpected flavor combinations. That I think most Americans aren't used to like tomato, totally. peanut, and um, sweet potato and collard greens. But it's so freaking it's good. So good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like my one of my biggest curses in life is that my husband really dislikes uh, both coconut and or peanut in oh. savory dishes and like 
that's half of my favorite foods. Yeah, mine too. Um, but he'll like it's it depends certain things he'll he'll make do. Uh, who is the food blogger that you like that you go to the most when you're um, cooking something? Um, so I really don't go to other food bloggers to cook stuff because I really only cook for my food blog and then I eat the leftovers so yeah. I don't I don't cook for myself at home um but I would say another food blogger that I, I really um admire is mm-hmm. um Lindsay and Bjork from Pinch of Yum Pinch I mean, of Yum yeah they are great they have a really similar um taste in food to me so I like all of the recipes and I just like them as people I think they have a lot of integrity so I like what nice. they're doing mm-hmm. yeah and now the time has come for our rapid fire questions I'm scared what do you invest in versus what are you cheap about um, so the older I get, I definitely shop more for quality mm-hmm. than um, for trends. And that's everything with like clothes and cars. I'm just a really practical person. Like I drive a super cheap car, but it works. And What kind of car do you have? I have a Kia Soul and it's 2013, I think. So. That's not that old comparatively. Yeah, but I plan to drive it till it's 10 years old at <laughs> least, you know. Um, so I just, I'm just not all about flashy stuff. Just give me something that works and is going to last. Nice. And what yeah. are you cheap about? Um, what am I cheap about? Toilet paper? I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. That's one place where I go no, quality. Uh, stuff that I, I'm just going to be throwing away. Like, I don't want to spend a lot on, like, um, garbage bags, you know? Stuff like that. Interesting. Yeah. I was at my – that's funny that you should say that because I was at my therapist this morning. I have therapy every Monday, and I was like, he switched to one ply <laughs> in his bathroom. And I was like, listen, doctor. <laughs> We both know how much money I'm paying you every week. I deserve <laughs> two ply toilet, toilet paper. paper of the highest quality. I mean, I'm not going to go that bad with toilet paper, but I'm going to buy like the Target brand and not Charmin. No, <laughs> you know but this mean? was like that toilet paper that's not, it's like one ply, but like rough. Yeah, like, it's like um, like tissue paper that you wrap gifts with. I was like, I, I was like, I'll pay you $5 more an hour, but it has to go to toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. What has been your best investment and why? Ooh, um, probably a good computer. Um, my, nice. Yeah, my Macs have lasted a good like six to eight years each. Nice. Not yeah. mine, uh, but only because I have used them. Oh. <laughs> uh, what kind of camera do you use out of curiosity to shoot all your food? Um, let me see if I remember. I never look at the models, so it's hard to remember. I haven't looked at the models since I bought it. Um, a Canon 6D Mark IV, I think. Nice. That means nothing to me. I'm sure Ryan knows what that is. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you ever shoot with iPhone? No, it's a disaster. I mean, if I do like a an Instagram story or something, like showing what I'm f- photographing, and it just looks so bad compared mm. to a real camera, I can't do it. I'm not skilled. Those iPhone 11s, those cameras are good. What has been your biggest money mistake and why? College. No. <laughs> um, I bet it probably was, though. No, I mean, it wasn't a total mistake. I have two degrees, and... Um, <laughs> I had to finance basically all of it. I mean, I worked full time for the first, I think, two or three years of college. And then after that, worked part time, soon realized that working part time was not worth the time I was losing actually learning what I needed Mm -hmm. to be learning at school. (laughs) So um, then I just got lots and lots and lots and lots of student loans. Oh, no. And it was, uh, the total was quite the number. But um, luckily, I've been able to pay that off, which I think. All of it? Yeah, and I think I just thanks. I think I just got lucky um, with my career um, because I think you know after I graduated, if I had gone into my original careers that I had gone to school school for, I would have never paid off those debts ever. Out of curiosity, we love a number on TFC. What was the original student loan debt? I, I guess I will say it just to give people hope, maybe, or to make them not feel so alone. I think I only looked at the total once because it was too scary. And it was like in the upper 80s, upper 80 thousand. I thought you were going to say like 250. No, I mean I didn't go to medical school, thank God. Um, but um, it was, you know, it's pretty. That's a lot. Yeah, it's it's a That's lot. That's a lot. Um, and then when you you know you start thinking about the interest, I'm sure I paid off double that amount. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's scary, and I, I hate the fact that people have to go through that. Totally. It's gross. It's really, yeah, it's unbelievable, especially when you think about, you know, looking at paying, you know, I have friends who pay $2,000 a month and are going to be paying $2,000 a month every month until they're, you know, in their 50s. Right. It's yeah. It's just, you have to completely recalibrate your entire life. Yeah. You know, it's just unbelievable. What is your biggest current money insecurity? 
Hmm. I think the fact that the industry I work in is brand new and I don't know if it will be there tomorrow. So, um, you know, I try to save as much as I can to be financially secure, but I, I don't know what tomorrow holds. You know, it's not like a normal career. You got a good retirement plan going? Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. Got your SEP IRA? Oh, yeah. I got, I got all that stuff. <laughs> nice. Good for you. All the goodies. Uh, what has been the financial habit that has helped you the most? Um, adopting a mindset that before I buy something, I ask myself, was I surviving without this before? Mm. And the answer is always yes. <laughs> so, I mean, because I was living before I bought this product. Um, so <laughs> that convinces me 90% of the time not to buy something. Uh, last question. When did you first feel quote unquote successful? And what does that word mean to you? Oh, I like that. Um, success has been such a journey. I think I first felt successful when I was able to quit my other job and just blog. Um, nice. Yeah. And I think just having the freedom to make my choices in life and not have to answer to some other company, a corporation, um, that's what success means to me. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Beth. Thank you for being here. It's been so much fun. It is my, so much my fun. My favorite podcast so far. Aww, thank you. Uh, so where can people go to get more of you? Budgetbites.com, and that's B-Y-T-E-S. And uh, where's the best place to follow you on social media? Instagram is is my jam. Budget Bites. Yep, Budget Bites. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for Thanks. being here. And uh, hopefully uh, we will see more of you soon on yeah. TFD. Totally. Bye. Bye, guys. So as we head into spring, not only are we heading into a huge variety of amazing produce options that are in season and wonderful, fun spring dishes like pesto pastas and all of those great vegetable forward dishes, we're also heading into tax time. And if you want to get a jump on your taxes and make sure that you're doing them in the smartest and most correct way possible and that you are getting the maximum possible refund that you're entitled to, which hopefully you'll spend part of on really smart food choices, you should check out TurboTax. Basically, TurboTax is a super simple program that walks you through the process of filing your taxes so that you can make sure that you're doing everything correctly and ensures that you are getting the best possible refund that you're entitled to. And now the same makers of TurboTax have come out with an awesome product called TurboTax Live, which offers all of those same benefits of making your tax filing process much more intuitive and easy to understand and gives you that peace of mind of knowing you're doing it correctly. But now it gives you the extra added benefit of being able to interact with their certified financial and tax experts. These are people who will be able to answer questions that you might have, make sure you're doing something correctly, just give you that extra layer of peace of mind and sign off that you know you're not messing up your taxes because let's be honest, it is really scary to think of possibly messing up your taxes and you want to ensure that you're doing it the right way. So TurboTax Live gives you that extra level of protection and security. Plus, as always, that guaranteed maximum possible refund that you're entitled to. Do not put off tax time because it comes no matter what with the arrival of spring and you'll want to be way ahead of the game when it comes time to getting your refund. So check out TurboTax and TurboTax Live at the link in our description or the show notes. <laughs> <laughs>